Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Olivia Madison, and I have the honor of chairing the Presidential Installation Committee. In my other life, I'm Dean of the Library. Um, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming to this evening's lecture by Erskine Bowles. Clearly the topic that Mr. Bowles will be addressing personally touches everyone in this room. Whether it's Iowa State students, faculty, staff, community citizens, invited families and guests of President and Mrs. Leith. The issues touch the entire nation. This evening's lecture is sponsored by the University Committee on Lectures and the Presidential Installation Committee as part of the celebratory events that surround the installation of our president, Dr. Stephen Leith. I also wish to specifically thank Pat Miller, director, and Molly Helmer's coordinator of the lectures program. They do a fantastic job and I cannot believe how many people came here. Uh, the University Lectures Program is a jewel in our crown. It has a long tradition of sporting speakers who address timely issues facing Iowa, the United States, and the world. And tonight is no exception. Well, Mr. Bowles' reason for being here at Iowa State is to formally introduce Dr. Leith at his installation tomorrow morning, which I hope all of you are coming to. Yes? Yes? Right? <laughs> I need to get one last ad in for that. Immediately following Mr. Bowles' address, there will be time for a few questions and observations from the audience. And we have some valiant individuals who will have mics so that uh, everyone can hear your uh, questions or observations. It is now my honor to turn the podium over to Pres um, President Stephen Leith, who will introduce Erskine Bowles. Good evening, folks. It does my heart good to see this many people turn out on an evening lecture, but I see this has been a trend at Iowa State. It makes me another reason I'm proud to be president here. And I'm really proud to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, Erskine is a great friend. He's been a mentor. He's been a colleague. He's been a leader for this country. So it's almost difficult for me to know where to start to describe Erskine. But most of all, I want to thank Erskine for being here in Iowa to be part of my installation celebration. I'm really honored that he has decided to come. He's a fascinating, multi-talented guy. You'll find he's very engaging, very thoughtful. And I think the subject of tonight's talk is something that's really resonating with all Americans right now. What does this country do about his debt? Erskine's a native North Carolinian. He's from Greensboro, North Carolina. So you may hear, hear some North Carolina expressions. When we worked for him, we called them Erskineisms. I don't know if he knows that. But <laughs> well, he's a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. He also has an advanced degree from Columbia University, and he holds eight honorary degrees. He served in the US Coast Guard. He's been an investment banker and an entrepreneur. And he's been a dedicated public servant. He served this nation at the highest level as administrator of the Small Business Administration, as Deputy Chief of Staff and Chief of Staff to the White House under President Clinton. And more recently, he served the world as the United States Deputy Special Envoy to coordinate the global response to the devastating tsunami that struck Southeast Asia in 2004. He's also been a university president leading the 17-campus University of North Carolina system from 2005 to 2011. And he served the state of North Carolina in many other capacities, including heading two rural economic development initiatives. He's been very much involved in charitable organizations, too, and community service organizations, especially the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, the Carolinas Medical Center, and helping sufferers of ALS. And his most recent activity, which leads to this lecture tonight for everyone, is a service in that started in 2010 and continues at the request of President Barack Obama 
as co-chair with former Senator Alan Simpson of the National Committee on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, which is a bipartisan effort to study the debt and reach a balanced budget. You know, Erskine has experience in this area too. He not only has a solid background in business and finance, but he has a previous track record of working in a bipartisan manner to address the nation's budget problems. He did it before, and he did it very successfully. As President Clinton's chief of staff, he was the White House's primary negotiator in the effort that produced our nation's last balanced budgets. He did. Erskine walked the aisles and he negotiated with a Congress that really was in the other party to bring this balanced budget to the nation. It's something I think we all look forward to seeing again someday. The Budget Commission led by Erskine Senator Simpson has actually produced a plan to reduce the nation's deficit by $4 trillion over the next decade. But unfortunately, it's a plan right now. It's stalled and we're really all anticipating what Erskine's going to tell us about the plan, why it's stalled, and what the future is for this country. So Erskine, please come forward. Thank you. Thank you. You'll all be happy to know this is my whole speech right here. And yes, uh, I tried to get Harrison Barnes and Marcus Page to come up here with me tonight. I probably shouldn't start that way. <laughs> there are a couple of things I thought about when uh, Steve was going through that introduction. Uh, the first was, uh, you know, that was my f uh, first rule in politics, and that's always be introduced by a person you appointed to high office. <laughs> Remember that and you'll do fine. Uh, the, the second was, it, re it reminded me uh, of when my Uncle Sam back in Greensboro, North Carolina, passed away. And when he passed away, uh, the obituary editor of the Greensboro Daily News called up my aunt to ask about him. And, you know, she kind of went on and on talking about all these things he had done like Steve did for me. And after a few minutes, the obituary editor said, now, Miss Bowles, you do know that we now charge. Yes, we charge $5 a word for every word in the obituary. Oh, she said, oh, no, no, I, I didn't know that. And she said, in that case, just put it in there. Sam died. This <laughs> is a true story. That's not even the funny part. And, uh, and he said, oh, Miss Bowles, we'd like to do that. But you see, we have this five-word minimum. Oh, she said, oh, my goodness. She said, in that case, put it in there. Sam died. Cadillac for sale. <laughs> Steve asked me uh, what I was coming in here tonight. I knew this was going to be my fun night. He said, uh, he said, Erskine, what is, what's it like to be, you know, CEO of a, a president of a university? I said, well, Steve, it's a little bit like being CEO of a cemetery. I said, you got lots of people underneath you, but ain't nobody listening. <laughs> And the other, other thing I thought about what he was talking about in 1997 when we did uh, balance the federal budget for the first time in a generation. Uh, President Clinton did bring me back to Washington to negotiate that on his behalf. And to get that done, I had to spend months and months and months locked up in conference rooms with Newt Gingrich. And I'm telling you what, you all owe me a lot for that. <laughs> Now, the topic they gave me to talk about tonight is, is tough. And so that's the end of most of the humor. <laughs> but I can tell you when the president called Alan Simpson, who, by the way, I think is an American treasure. He is, you should clap for him. He's, I learned a tremendous amount from him. He's smart, he's quick. He's solid, he's got great values, and he's a good human being. But when the president asked Alan and I to head this commission up, we both thought we were doing this for our grandkids. 
our, his six and, and my nine. But the more we looked at the numbers, the more we came to realize that we weren't doing it for our grandkids. We weren't even doing it for our kids. We were doing it for us. I can tell you that if we don't get these politicians in Washington to wake up and put partisanship aside and pull together rather than pull apart, we face the most predictable economic crisis in history. But fortunately for all of us, it's also the most avoidable economic crisis in history. But the math is clear. The fiscal path that this nation is on today is simply not sustainable. These deficits, these deficits of over a trillion dollars a year are like a cancer. And they're a cancer that I promise you is going to destroy this country from it within if we don't wake up and decide we're going to deal with it. Let me just give you one mathematical example that I think will make it clear to all of you. If you take all of the revenue that came into the country last year, every single dollar, 100% of it was spent on our mandatory spending and interest on the debt. Mandatory spending is principally the money we spend on the entitlements for Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security. So what does that mean? That means every dollar we spent last year, not 20 years ago, not 20 years from now, but right now, every single dollar we spent last year on these two wars, national security, homeland security, education, infrastructure, high value added research, every single dollar was borrowed and half of it was borrowed from foreign countries. That is crazy. That's a formula for failure in anybody's book. None of your companies could be run that way. This university couldn't be run that way. And every time that Alan and I go talk to a group like this, they always look at me and the first question is, Erskine, why? Why would we do this? This is crazy. What are we spending all this money on? And Al and I always turn it around and we say, well, you tell us. And I swear to goodness, people always say the, the same three or four things. I used to say four things, but I didn't want to get in one of those Rick Perry deals. And... <laughs> but but, but yeah, people, people say, oh, I'll tell you what we spend this money on. Waste, fraud, and abuse. Somebody else will say foreign aid. Somebody else says Nancy Pelosi's airplane. <laughs> oil subsidies. You could take all of those things and put them in a thimble compared to where our real challenges are. We have five principal challenges that this nation faces. And any politician from the right or the left who comes to you and doesn't talk about these issues is not being honest with you. The biggest challenge we face is health care. We spend twice as much as any other country in the world on health care. And that's true whether you talk about it on a per capita basis or as a percent of GDP. And any of you here that don't think those 40 million people who don't have health care insurance don't get health care, you're crazy. They get health care. They just get into the emergency room at seven to eight times the cost of being a doctor's office. And you know who pays for it? You do. You pay for it in higher taxes and higher insurance premiums. In 1981, we spent 10% of the federal budget on health care. Today we spend 25% of the budget 
on health care. And if we do nothing, by the year 2020, we'll be spending a third of the budget on health care, and it won't be long before we'll be a country that can just take care of a couple old coots like me and Al and buy a few tanks. Health care is number one. Number two is defense. We spend more on national defense in this country than the next 15 largest countries combined. Think about that. I said the next 15 largest countries combined. That includes both Russia and China. I personally think that America is bearing a disproportionate responsibility today for global world peace. And I think that America cannot afford to be the world's policeman. And I believe Admiral Mullen, who was President Bush and President Obama's chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, got it right. When he was asked, he was asked, what's our greatest national security problem today? He didn't say these terrorists. He said it's these deficits because they will consume every dollar of resource that we have. Let me just give you one example of how crazy it is. Today, we here in America, we have a treaty with Taiwan that will protect Taiwan if they're invaded by the Chinese. There's just one problem with that. We'll have to borrow the money from China to do it. <laughs> it's crazy. So that's number two. Number three is our income tax code. We have the most inefficient, ineffective, globally anti-competitive tax code that man could dream up. You couldn't design a stupider one. I promise you any class here at Iowa State could design an income tax code that made more sense. People ask me all the time, how can we possibly have nominal income tax rates that are so high and net such relatively little amount of money from our income tax? We take in $1.3 trillion a year in income taxes, both corporate and individual. We spend $3.6 trillion a year. So how do we end up taking in so little? And the reason is we have $1.1 trillion. Remember, we only take in $1.3. We have $1.1 trillion worth of spending in the tax code. Spending that a lot of us in this room, including me, like. It's these deductions and credits. Well, we said in our commission, let's try something different. Let's broaden the base. Let's simplify the code. And let's try something. Let's get rid of all of that backdoor spending in the tax code. Let's just wipe it out and start at zero. What could we do? Well, if you took 92% of the money and used it to reduce income tax rates, and 8% of the money and used it to reduce the deficit, 8% is about $100 billion a year. Over 10 years, that's $1 trillion. And if you remember from Steve's introduction, we wanted to reduce the deficit by $4 trillion a year, $1 trillion from revenue, $3 trillion from spending reductions. So we're going to use 8% of this money to reform the tax code and to reduce the deficit. And we're going to use 92% of the money to reduce income tax rates. But what would happen to your income taxes? We could take income tax rates to 8% up to $70,000 a year, 14% up to $210,000 a year, and have a maximum marginal income tax rate of 23%.
we could take the corporate rate to 26% and therefore be globally competitive. And we could actually pay for what's called a territorial system so that that 1.5 trillion that today is captured overseas could be brought back to the U.S. to create jobs over here. Now we think a system like that makes sense. Some of my friends who are Democrats say, oh Erskine, if you allow those corporations to bring that money back here, all they'll use it for is dividends and to buy back stock. And I say, hooray! That's like, great! That money will be circulating in this country rather than staying overseas and creating jobs over there. So we think that's a smarter income tax code. We think that will create dynamic growth in real jobs in this country. The fourth biggest challenge we face is not one that we ever thought about in terms of deficit reduction, but it does have an impact, and that's Social Security. Social Security over the next decade is $900 billion cash negative. What we want to do with Social Security is make it sustainably solvent. So the promise that's been made to you all will actually come true. Because today, if we do nothing, and we just kind of have the ostrich theory and stick our heads in the sand, Social Security under current law will go broke in 2033. And when you waddle up to the window to get your Social Security check, it'll be 25% less under current law with no changes than what's for scheduled payment. So what we wanted to do was to restructure Social Security so it would be sustainably solvent. And we did a couple of things actually in there that actually cost money. And that was kind of hard to do as a deficit reduction commission. But one of our key principles in our our plan was to make sure that we took care of a truly disadvantaged. So we actually raised the minimum payment to 125% of poverty. And we gave everyone between 81 and 86 a 1% per year annual bump up because every Republican and Democrat economist that came to see us said that's when most people's private pension plans run out. And both of those cost money. And yes, we are the guys that recommended raising the retirement age. We recommend, recommended raising it one year, 40 years from now. We wanted to give you all time to get ready. <laughs> and one more year, 65 years from now, when my grandkids will be eligible. And, and you wouldn't believe the hate mail. I mean, death threats are the worst. But I'm telling you, you know, we have to fix it. This, this guy, Roosevelt, he was a very, very, very smart guy. When he put in Social Security, uh, average life expectancy was 63. You got Social Security at 65. That is a very smart guy. <laughs> Today you get average life expectancy is 78, you get it at 62, we have an arithmetic problem. We felt we should step up to it, admit it, and fix it, and make it sustainably solvent. Fifth challenge, and last one I'll mention tonight, is our old friend compound interest, something that all of us have had to deal with, something that you all will deal with you know, when you start paying back this debt to your bar and to go to college. But today, this nation spends $250 billion a year on interest payments. And that's at today's really low interest rates. If interest rates were at their median level that they were in the 1990s or in the first decade of this year, we'd be spending $650 billion a year on interest. 
That's more than we spend on defense. But even at $250 billion a year, just to make it, kind of put it relative, we're spending more on interest today than we spend at the Department of Commerce, Education, Energy, Homeland Security, Justice, Interior, and State combined. And if we do nothing, again that old ostrich theory, we'll be spending over a trillion dollars a year in interest cost alone in 2020. Think about that. A trillion dollars a year. That's doubly bad for you guys. You know, it's a trillion dollars we can't spend on education. It's a trillion dollars we can't spend on infrastructure. It's a trillion dollars we can't spend here at Iowa State to do high value added research to create the next new thing in this country. And it's doubly bad because it is a trillion dollars we'll spend principally in Asia to educate their kids, to build their infrastructure, to create the next new thing over there. So the jobs of the future are there, not here. We can't do that. We can't. And when the politicians come to you, I know they've been here all winter long. God, I don't know how you stand it. <laughs> but when they come back asking you for your vote, and if any of them tell you, oh, don't worry about this stuff. We're going to grow our way out of this problem. You can't solely grow your way out of this problem. We could have double-digit growth for decades, and that alone wouldn't solve this problem. It'd help, but it wouldn't solve a problem. And any of my Democrat friends who come to you and say, don't worry about this, we're going to tax our way out of this problem. We can't solely tax our way out of this problem. Raising taxes doesn't do a darn thing to change the demographics of this country or to change the fact that health care is growing at a faster rate than GDP. And as physically conservative as I am, you know, I can't come here and tell you that we can solely cut our way out of this problem. We can't cut our way out of this problem without disrupting what I believe is still a very, very fragile economic recovery, or without hurting the truly disadvantaged, or without cutting education and infrastructure and research so deeply that America's not going to be able to compete effectively in what is today truly a knowledge-based global economy. So what our commission tried to do was to put forth a reasonable, responsible, bipartisan plan that would reduce the federal deficit by $4 trillion a year. And we just didn't make up that $4 trillion number uh, because the number four bus passes on the street. $4 trillion is not the, the maximum amount we need to reduce the deficit over the next decade. It's not the ideal amount. Believe you me, it is the minimum amount we have to reduce the deficit over the next decade to stabilize the debt and get it on a downward path as a percent of GDP. We got a trillion of it from reforming the tax code and three trillion from real spending cuts. We got a majority of Republicans on our commission to vote for it. We got a majority of Democrats and a supermajority of a commission. And the, the breadth of viewpoints of people who voted yes was really amazing. We had six sitting U.S. senators on our commission. 
three Republicans and three Democrats. All three Republicans voted yes, and two out of the three Democrats did. And it was everybody from Dick Durbin, the liberal senator from Illinois, voting yes, to Tom Coburn, the conservative senator from Oklahoma, voting yes. And they did it because they thought it was the responsible thing to do, the right thing to do for the country. Durbin said honestly, he said, there are things in here that I hate worse than the devil hates holy water. He said, but we got to do this. I think it's the right thing to do. And the reason I was so glad that Steve gave me a chance to talk to you all is I want you all to think about this. You know, I just finished six years at the University of North Carolina. And so I'll give you an analogy from a campus. I thought about just walking over here with Jerry. There was this Nobel Prize winning scientist. I think his name was Ernst Rutherford. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And, you know, his Nobel Prize winning project was running out of money. And he turned to his team and said, hey, we're running out of money. Now we've got to start thinking. <laughs> well, that's what America is. We're running out of money. Now we've got to start thinking. We've got to make choices. We've got to make tough choices. We've got to make these hard political choices. And the time is drawing nigh. At the end of this year, we face what people are calling this fiscal cliff. We have over seven trillion dollars of economic events that are going to hit America right in the gut at the end of this year. They come from the expiration of the Bush tax cuts, the expiration of the payroll tax cut, the expiration of the patch that goes over the alternative minimum tax so it doesn't hit the middle class. We got this mindless, senseless cuts that are in this, coming from this sequester, which came about because of the failed super committee where nobody could reach agreement. And you know, they're across the board cuts. And any of you who run a business know that the smart way to cut any budget is not across the board. You know, you want to look at those things that you really need to cut. Well, if, if we breach this fiscal cliff and nothing happens, the economic effects next year will be devastating. Economic growth will be slowed by at least 2%, which means we're back into recession. Two million people will lose their jobs, unemployment nationwide will be above 9%. It's crazy. And we don't have to do it. You know, while the rest of America is having a, a very fragile economic recovery, in Washington, they're having an election. I think Hubert Humphrey was right. At least this is what I came to believe the longer I stayed in Washington. He described Washington as 26 square miles surrounded by reality. I think going over this fiscal cliff is crazy. And yet if you talk to Republicans and Democrats, both sides, you know, both of them are talking about doing it, thinking that if we go over, you know, we can reach agreement really quickly, and if we go over, you know, I'm going to have a, a better negotiating position. Well, I'm telling you, if we go over and we don't reach agreement, what we've done is bet the country, and that's a risk nobody should take. So what Al and I and the members of our commission have been doing over the last year is 
really working to give us a chance to get something done during the lame duck session of Congress. You'd think that they would be working night and day in Congress to do something about this, you know, these $7 trillion worth of economic events that are going to happen in December. It's not a maybe, they're going to happen. But they're doing nothing. Zero. If this was your company, your university, you'd have your guys working night and day on it. But they're all waiting for the election. Well, if we wait to the election, it'll be too late to get anything done during the lame duck, and for sure we'll go over this fiscal cliff. So Al and I have been taking this little 67-page report that we wrote, and we've been, it's in plain English, you all can read it, it's called The Moment of Truth, it's right up on the web, it's easy to understand, and we've been putting it in legislative language. And now it's 650 pages. <laughs> It is. It's crazy. It's 650 pages. And we've been taking it around and meeting with various members of the Senate and the House and trying to build up support for it. And today we have about 47 members of the Senate, 24 Republicans, 23 Democrats, and about 150 members of the House. Again, about an equal number of Republicans and Democrats who've agreed that you know, this is a, a good approach. Not perfect, but good. And, um, you know, that's progress. It's not 60, but you have to have in the Senate. It's not 218 you have to have in the House, but it's progress. We've also formed a, a CEO Fiscal Leadership Council where we have a couple of hundred Fortune 500 CEOs and lots of owners of businesses like the ones that you all run, small businesses, who have been willing to join this council to encourage members of Congress to put partisanship aside and to pull together rather than pull apart. And we also have a social media campaign, which you can get to by going to fixthedebt.org. Fix the debt. How clever. Uh, and our, ho our, our hopes are to get uh, a couple of million people uh, to sign this petition that, again, encourages the members of Congress to do just what I've said. We've got about a couple of hundred thousand that signed it, but most people that have ever signed any petition in history is 1.3 million. So we're trying to beat that. And I hope the people in this room will help us. Uh, we went to... Uh, uh, I made the graduation speech at American University the other day, and I talked about this, and a bunch of kids form, kick, you know, they, they form this group where, you know, we always talk about my generation, you should be mad at me because we kicked the can down the road. So they formed a group called the Can Kicks Back. <laughs> and it's spreading around campuses, and I hope you have one here at Iowa State. But I believe that if we can get these guys to put the politics aside and pull together, that they can come up with a framework of a plan that reduces the budget deficit by $4 trillion. I think we can have it, make it substantive. I think we can have real clarity. I think we can have a down payment, a timeline. I'd like to get this thing done by July 4th of next year. And I think we can uh, have a fail-safe provision in there that will make them have to do something if they fail. Uh, I think we can make it so that uh, we can reform the tax code by broadening the base and simplifying the code. I think we can slow the rate of growth of health care to the rate of growth of the economy. I think we can make Social Security solvent, and I think we can phase this plan in over a long enough period of time where we don't disrupt a very fragile economic recovery, we don't hurt the truly disadvantaged, and we're able to have enough money to invest in education and infrastructure and research. And I believe if we do that, the future of America is very, very bright, and we're going to be able to compete with the best and brightest wherever they are. And I believe if we don't, America is well on its way to becoming a second-rate power. Let's don't let that happen. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is Iowa. I'm glad to take any questions that you want. Anywhere. Not me. Yeah, what? We're trying to get we're trying to get the mic to you. Sounds like Star Wars. Yes, ma'am. Why don't you just yell? I can hear you, and I'll repeat it. Oh, got it? Okay. All right. Um, some of us know that Social Security Insurance Program is a separate trust fund supported by payroll taxes and is not part of the federal budget, which is supported by general revenues. By law, any surplus in that fund must be invested in U.S. Treasury bonds. This money is then used for non-Social Security purposes like wars, tax cuts, ag supports, you name it. So, so this is a debt that the Treasury owes the Social Security Trust Fund. And by law, there is a promise that they will send that money to Social Security when it's needed to cover benefits. So I get really angry when I hear you talk about Social Security as part of a debt reduction plan. I, I don't know why you're doing that. Actually, aren't the bonds that are in, aren't the bond, or the money invested in Treasury bonds equal to what we get from China? Same thing, isn't it? So why is this considered part of the debt? Social Security has a problem, but it has nothing to do with the debt. Probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> I think I was very careful to say that when I discussed Social Security as a problem, it wasn't because of the deficit. Social Security is $900 billion cash negative. I didn't make that up over the next decade. That is a fact. That's arithmetic. And again, if we do nothing, and these kids go to collect their Social Security in the year 2033, and this is coming from the Social Security trustees. And again, this is easy to do because it's a defined benefit. I mean, we know exactly what you're going to be due. The, what they're going to be able to give you is 25% less. The scheduled payment, you are right. It's what you are owed. But under law, they can only pay you what's available, and what's available will only be 25% less, and it will skew down after that. You know, you're right. There's about $2 trillion in the Social Security Trust Fund. The problem is, when I want my Social Security payment, you know, I want money. And so I go and, you know, I'm due X amount of dollars every month. And I go and ask for it, and the government goes to the Social Security Trust Fund, but there are only these IOUs in there. And so they have to go borrow the money because there's no money in the general fund, because the general fund doesn't have any money today. And so they have to go borrow from a third party. So whether you like it or not, you know, it is part of a debt. It's a debt owed to you, but unfortunately there's nothing there, so it has to go out and borrow it from a third party. Got one back here. Hey. Yes, sir. Um, How can you get elected if you follow the, what we like to call it the Simpson Bowles plan instead of a Bowles Simpson plan? Because everything in Washington is known by its initials and. Uh, um, I forgot, I was so busy being cute, I forgot your question. Uh, but, but, 
it, it's hard. Let me tell you why it's hard. You know, all of the members, everybody here understands the arithmetic, everybody understands the economics, everybody understands we have a real problem, that we've made promises we simply can't keep, and we either have to raise revenue or we have to cut spending or do some combination of both in order to meet these future needs that we promised. So everybody gets it. But hey, if I'm running for office and I come to you and say, I'm going to raise your taxes and cut your benefits now, vote for me. You know, that's really a hard sell. You know, so that's why you don't see the politicians standing up and telling you what the facts are. You know, because it's, you know, the problems are real, the solutions are painful, there is no easy way out. And they're afraid that if they tell you the truth, you won't reelect them. And for most of these politicians, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, you know, they are worried about getting reelected. And oh, by the way, if you're a Republican, and you're running, you know, the elections are no longer in November, they're in the primaries because of the way the districts are all divided up. And if you're a Republican and you're running for office and you tell people that you're willing to be flexible on this and you might consider, you know, raising some revenue, they'll run somebody against you in the primary and they'll beat you. And if you're a Democrat, and you say that you're going to cut Medicare and Medicaid and you're going to you know, reform Social Security, you know, she's going to vote against you and, you know, you don't have a chance. And so that's why it's difficult for these politicians to face up to these facts. And what I'm asking you to do is to know what the reality is and be willing to force these guys to tell you the truth and don't vote for them and don't give them your money unless they're willing to do something about this problem. Because if we don't, we face the most predictable economic crisis in history. Got a question back here. And, no, I'm, yeah, can I go? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your, um, over here, rational and balanced um, talk. It's too bad that you have left Washington. Um, so I'm curious your thoughts and the Commission's thoughts about the Affordable Care Act because there's lots of rhetoric on both sides and how you actually think that that would potentially control um, federal spending on health care. That's a good question. Uh, and again, health care is the biggest problem. Let me just tell you about what, where the playing field is and then I'll tell you what we think, right or wrong. Uh, the Democrats believe that the cuts they've already made to Medicare and Medicaid and the pilot programs they've set up in the Affordable Health Care Act or Obamacare, whatever you want to call it, uh, that those are enough to slow the rate of growth of health care to GDP plus one. Uh, we didn't believe that. Uh, we came to the conclusion that you'd have to make additional cuts, and so we recommended about $485 billion of additional cuts to various health care programs over the next decade if, with the hopes that that would slow the rate of growth of health care to GDP plus one. Uh, people like uh, uh, Congressman Paul Ryan, who I personally like a lot, I think he's smart, I think he's straightforward, uh, I think he's honest, uh, but people like Paul believed and voted against our plan uh, that that wasn't enough to slow the rate of growth of health care to GDP plus one. So they made uh, two recommendations. One was to block grant Medicaid to the states on the theory that one size doesn't fit all and that if each individual governor is given control of the Medicaid budget that they can cover more people at lower cost. Uh, we thought that was an enormous change and therefore, we felt it made more sense instead of taking it to all 50 states at one, we, we should test it. And we should test it in 10 states, and we should test it in a rural state, an urban state, a small state, a large state, and see if it worked. See if the theory was right. It's now being tested in Rhode Island, and it's actually working pretty well. I know Washington State has asked for a waiver. We'll see how it works there. But again, that was the theory. And it's a we thought it was kind of a big risk to take because if you look at your state budget and the states now have responsibility for half of Medicare, it's just eating the state budget alive. 
It's one of the reasons why you have to cut back on education and other areas. So again, we thought, boy, if they get responsibility for the whole Medicaid, and you know, and it, and the, it comes with a provision that you know it's not going to be increased by more than inflation. And since healthcare costs are growing faster than inflation, wow, that could really be a bad thing for the states. But we'll see. You know, that's uh, that's the argument. The second thing they recommended was to take Medicare to what they called a premium support plan. But basically, it's no different than a lot of companies have done. It's just changing it from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan. And in a defined contribution plan, instead of guaranteeing you that you have X number of benefits that you can count on, they guarantee you X number of dollars. And they let it grow at the rate of inflation, or they let it grow at the rate of the economy. And if, in fact, health care costs increase at a faster rate, then you have to take fewer benefits or you have to pay more money. Uh, and that's what would happen with Medicare if, in fact, you went with a defined contribution plan as opposed to a defined benefit plan. What we decided uh, in our commission was that we came to the belief that, that everybody ought to have health care insurance. Uh, but we, we had two really big caveats to that. One is we felt everybody ought to have some skin in the game. And we felt uh, that if you all, the, the taxpayers, were going to pay for everybody to have health care insurance, that we shouldn't pay for anybody to have a Cadillac plan. You know, that we ought to pay for everybody to have a pretty darn good Chevrolet. And we took parts A and B of Medicaid, and we combined them, Medicare, excuse me, we combined them, and we put in a $500 deductible, and then you'd pay 20% up to $5,500, 5% up to $7,500, and then everything else would be covered. And if you do that, you save really hundreds of billions of dollars a year. But if everybody is going to have health care insurance, then everybody needs a medical home. And if everybody's going to be provided a medical home, then by golly, you need more primary care physicians, more nurse practitioners, more physician's assistants, and therefore universities like mine and the University of Iowa, they need to be incentivized to produce those kind of docs as opposed to specialists. Uh, we decided that if you're going to make sure everybody has access to prescription drugs, then by God, it ought to be... Uh, what do you call them, uh, generic drugs rather than name brand drugs. And oh, by the way, again, if you the taxpayers are going to pay for it, then we ought to have the right to negotiate the price of those prescription drugs. Why should we pay 40% more for the same drugs in the Medicare program as we pay for those same drugs at the Veterans Administration? It's crazy. You all are paying for them. This is very controversial, at least with people in my party. But again, you know, I think any, you know, in North Carolina, the public hospitals all report to the president of the university. So I've had lots of time and with this subject. But anybody here who doesn't think that doctors and hospitals practice defensive medicine, you're crazy. They do. They have to. And so we said, look, we ought to have real malpractice reform, and we've got to have some real tort reform to bring down the cost of health care. We said that we ought to start paying for quality rather than quantity, and therefore you need things like accountable care organizations, and we've got to do something about this whole end-of-life scenario without talking about death panels. And if we do things like this, we can really get the cost of health care under control. That was our plan. Yes, sir. We got a question back here. Um, just two questions quickly. Uh, first where, off, uh, in regards to health care. Where are uh, you? What? I see. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, Given that, say, other Western countries, like, say, everything from everyone from Japan to Canada to France to Germany to any number of other European countries run their health care systems in some form of universal health care system, and they manage to have uh, significant low, significantly lower amounts of GDP spent on health care, um, why would you, the Commission, excuse me, why did the Commission not uh, suggest such an approach instead of what you just outlined? And as a more broad question, uh, what exactly uh, 
brought about the uh, one to three ratio with regards to increases in revenue and spending cuts. Sure. Was it purely just the political considerations you mentioned a few minutes ago, or were there more broader considerations that the committee focused upon? Thank you. Ted Gum, I went to Carolina. I can't remember two questions at once. <laughs> If I was an engineer, I could do better at this. Uh, on the, the health care, we did uh, recommend universal coverage. That's what our plan is. It's just in, it's not a single payer plan that you might want, but we did recommend universal coverage. And again, don't forget everybody does get health care. They, you know, those that don't have health care insurance get into the emergency room, and the cost is already in the system. That's why if you look at the data, you know, we do pay twice as much as any other country. Only 85% of our people are covered, you know, yet we're paying twice as much as any other country for health care. So, again, that's why we believe universal coverage makes sense. Uh, on the three to one, uh, a, a couple of reasons for that, which I hope uh, will make sense to you. Uh, if you look at uh, projections for 2020, you have spending at 24%. And revenue at 19 percent. We've all the only uh, the only times we've ever balanced the budget in the last 50 years. Uh, I think there are four times that we've done it. Uh, revenues have always been around just right under 21 percent of GDP. And uh, I didn't want to see personally more than one-third of the uh, closure of that gap we had between 24 percent and 19 percent come from revenue and I didn't believe based on the economic analysis that we did that you could take more than 21 percent uh, out of the economy uh, without doing some harm to the economy uh, but again it's going to be really hard to to hold spending to 21 percent of GDP we got it uh, in our plan, spending by the year 2020 down to right below 22 percent, and we had revenue at 21 percent, so we had a 1 percent deficit, and we could get uh, the debt to GDP ratio down to 67 percent. If you looked at uh, Congressman Ryan's plan, he got spending to 20 percent of GDP, revenue to 19 percent of GDP. He also had the same 1% deficit, and he got the debt-to-GDP ratio down to 62%. The president wasn't, uh, his plan was 23% of GDP for spending, and I think uh, revenue was around 20%, so he had a 3% deficit, and he got the debt-to-GDP ratio down to 76%, did stabilize the debt, but in his plan it starts to go up in the outer years, which was unacceptable. So again, that was, we felt that was where the, the budget had been balanced in the past. The reason it's hard is the demographics of a country have changed so rapidly, and you've got more people that are retiring, people of my age who, you know, are, are becoming eligible for the entitlement programs. And so again, it's with the change in the demographic, it's going to be very hard to get spending down to 21%, but I believe it can be done. We had a question over here. That's the same lady that already asked me one. No, she was behind me. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad to see you. <laughs> I would like to um, offer a friendly suggestion to help reduce the debt, and that is taxing stock trades, which could raise about a one and a half trillion dollars over a decade. I understand you and your committee never seriously considered a financial speculation tax. Would you explain? Yeah, actually we did. Uh, we did consider it and we couldn't get enough votes on the commission to do it. It's not a bad idea. You know, it's a, a good way to, to generate revenue and I personally wouldn't be opposed to it. Uh, you know, one of the things we looked at as an example, just to show you the things we considered, uh, we considered a value added tax. I would, you know, myself, I would a lot rather, you know, if you can make it so it's not so regressive, and I believe you can economically, you know, I'd a lot rather tax consumption than I would wages or capital. Uh, it would help our exports uh, a, a lot if we had a value added tax instead of an income tax. 
And, you know, we had a lot of discussion about it because you could really take the income tax rate really low if you had a value added tax. But the Republicans on our commission, you know, made a really good point that I hadn't considered before, but I think they were right. And, you know, nobody would keep the income tax where it is today and have a value added tax. You take the income tax really low and have a pretty low value added tax, and that would, would be a, a new form of revenue for the country. But the Republicans said that if you, if you had a value added tax and an income tax, that those would be two engines of revenue and the Congress wouldn't be able to help themselves. They would drive them both. And I think they're right. I mean, I really do. And I, I hadn't thought of that myself. So again, we looked at lots of different forms of revenue and we had some forms of revenue in there that some people didn't like. As an example, one of the things in our plan is we said, look, we're now spending uh, X amount more on, uh, on transportation uh, than we take in. And the gap could be filled by a 15%, a 15 cents per gallon gas tax. And we said, hey, look, we ought to either cut back the amount we're spending or we ought to raise the revenue, but we shouldn't do you know, both. We shouldn't spend more than we take in. And so we said, look, it's an option. You know, either cut your spending or raise your revenue, but do one or the other. And if you don't like a gas tax, you know, let's look at your one and a half cent, you know, tax on uh, securities trades. Uh, but we got to have the revenue. Yes, sir. This will be my last question. Uh, what can we do to that and keep the recovery going at the same time? Uh, I'm, I'm, the question was, what can we do to address the debt and keep a strong recovery going? One of the things that, you know, people talk about our plan, because the plan we put in, as it turns out, is pretty similar to the plan they did in the UK. And, you know, they've had terrible economic results in the UK, and people were worried, you know, that if, a, you know, if we had too much austerity in the US, then that would in its own right drive us into recession and really hurt the economic recovery. In the UK what they did is they also did one dollar for three dollars uh, and I think you know very similar to what we did they did theirs after ours they also put a cost benefit analysis on all government programs they raised the retirement age you know they capped the amount they would spend on health care and they did it all in order to get to a balanced budget within five years and what we clearly saw is that was too much too quickly. And if we did that, we felt it really could lead to a recession. So what we did is we felt it should be phased in and have, you know, we got to start on it now, but we got to do progressively more as we go out. And we got to have really good fail safe provisions so that we actually do this. And so by phasing it in over a longer period of time, you can not disrupt a very fragile economic recovery and you can have enough resources to really reduce the debt, get it down to a reasonable level, and then you can control the, the debt as we go forward and have enough money to invest so that your future is very bright. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Erskine and I will be around for a little while in the reception next door, and then we'll have to head out after that because we've got a big day tomorrow. But we'll be here for a little bit, and there's a reception for everyone on the side of the room here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.